Hello World War II history buffs, war games players, hearts of iron players. This is Gamer1745 and I'm going to be talking about resources in the Second World War, particularly dealing with modeling of them in um, war games. Um, we're going to be looking at is hearts of iron 3 here is the example, but this goes for at, at the ground base level. At, any war game and what it's trying to do. I hope you'll be interested in that. If you're interested in these types of things, talking about history, dealing with war games, and you're new here, please hit the subscribe button. And everyone, if you would hit the thumbs up button, really appreciate that. And of course, I would love to hear your comments, criticisms, um, corrections. I do have some notes for this talk, but I'm sure I'll get something wrong. Um, so everyone can look down below in the comments to see corrections and whatnot. All right, resources in a game. We're looking at what has been termed a grand strategy game. And how what I would define that as different than just a strategy or a strategic game is one that you make decisions, if you will, on the back end of the game. Not just where the divisions go, and, and in this game, which I really like, who's going to be, um, you know, commanding different units, you know, is modal gonna command this, is list gonna command this, is, you know, um, whoever, Kerbal, is he gonna command what division? So not only are you making this, where divisions go, who commands them. You're also making the decisions on what gets built. Um, what with this game here, we can look at um, what, what infrastructure gets built, what um, resources get exploited. Um, click on the right. Wow up here, click on the right one, what resources, because these have resource buildings. Some of these are unbuildable, but by your choices in the game, it will build um, some of these things. So you're, you're making, do you want to do more focused on capital ship building or more focused on submarine building by some of your choices in the game? And that's what makes, to me, the grand strategy game so interesting. I do like playing a game like War in the East, one or two, but that is you're playing the theater commander and he doesn't get to decide how much fuel he gets. He doesn't get to decide how many aircraft he gets. He doesn't get to decide how many divisions he gets. He only gets to decide what to do with those things that are made available to him. Yeah, on the edges, there's maybe some some decisions like those, but not primarily. It's, you know, it's the, um, where are the aircraft gonna go? How many are gonna protect Germany? Now this could also be, I'm gonna be looking at German here, but it could be Britain. How many are going, how many aircraft are gonna um, protect Britain? You know, um, whether it's during the classical Battle of Britain time or just protecting Britain, how many aircraft are going to be used to bomb Germany? How many aircraft are going to be sent down to, you know, on other fronts, whether it's the Western Desert or, you know, out in Asia? Um, it's those decisions that in a grad, grand strategy game you get to make compared to a strategy game. If you're, you know, so you get the point there. That is the difference. And we're looking at grand, interpreting World War II into grand strategy. And this is one thing I, w I want to say, I'm going to be talking about different historical topics here. I really love somebody like TIK, who in a video format reads the books. I mean, he's not doing, at least for the most part, original source um, research, but he reads the, the good in-depth books and he presents you the historical facts of the situation. I am fascinated by that. But what I'm also fascinated are um, 
alternative choices. We'll get to some more of that that you get to make. Now, so looking at that, that's what a grand strategy is, is you're making decisions, what gets mined, what gets um, refined, um, what, you know, um, what gets built, you know, tanks or aircraft, or how, what's the percentage of tanks to aircraft, to submarines, to rifles, to artillery. You get to decide all of that. And I also really like in Hearts of Iron 4 that you get to decide to, depending on the mod, down to the artillery pieces, uh, you know, how many heavy, how many light artillery pieces kind of thing you, you make, and you make those decisions, and those will affect how well equipped, say, your divisions are, and um, you can make those choices. Now, there's really good war gaming to be done is you're just going to play with basically the historical division components of Germany in World War II. But as we well know, you play um, War in the East too. divisions will take losses and replacements won't necessarily um, cover all the losses, so divisions will be or can be weaker than they were historically. Um, either the individual division, because you send it into a different battle and it got beat badly, or um, just generally speaking. So, um, and you have to you have to deal with what was there, and that is a very good way of war game. But what I really fascinates me is trying to model the grand strategy now that's defining grand strategy now player expectations that's a tough one how real do you want to get and i don't mean how real in the sense of details you know because you know uh, what button manufacturers are making what buttons for you know the troops do you have enough buttons? Do you have enough boots? Do you have enough bootlaces? I'm not meaning that. I'm meaning do you make a game that how constrained how constrained will the players be? And ultimately if you're making a game as opposed to a pure simulation and we'll get into um, how that's difficult in World War II, but um, where you get to make choices. Um, you don't you don't want a game that is unfun to play. And so, to me, I want a game that is historically plausible or historically realistic not some fantasy game uh you know what if you know too much too much what if is a problem right so but you have so you have to keep players expectations in there and some of this we can look at say italy in world war ii italy was ha the best Arm for, best equipped armed forces of the three armed forces of Italy, of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, the best equipped was the Navy. But whether it was the political leadership, um, the King and El Duce, or whether it was the Admiralty, you know, the, command, the, the high level decision making of the Admiralty, or both, and I don't know the detail, an, the detailed answer to answer of this is they were afraid of losing their fleet. They had this, not the best fleet out there, but the best of the armed forces within, you know, Italy. The, uh, the army particularly is woefully ill-equipped, but the Navy's very well equipped for, compared to a lot of nations, you know, maybe not compared to Britain or Japan or America, but compared to Turkey or Spain or uh, the Soviet Union, um, they have a very well-equipped Navy, but they're afraid to lose it. So it really restrains their use of it. They want to only engage the enemy when they believe that they have a material advantage. 
meaning two, I don't think just, you know, material is in like, whoa, 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 there's one enemy battleship. We spotted it out there. It's, it just has two destroyer escorts. Let's send out four of our battleships and go sink it. Yeah, they'll do that, but it's, they won't go, oh, there's three British battleships out there. We won't send our four out there because, yeah, we might win that, but we might end up with three of our battleships on the bottom of this ocean and three of theirs, and just only one that's going to cost us too much. The cost of losing the ships was um, too dear to the Italians, but also a major constraint on Italy is felt um, not just for their, you know, their large fleet assets, but operationally, generally, is the lack of fuel oil for um, the ships. So the idea of running around and patrolling everywhere to hunt submarines or whatever is a costly um, exercise for Italy in fuel. And if you don't have fuel, your ships are useless. So they had a conserve, need to conserve fuel situation. How best is that to model into the game? And how much would players balk at the idea of, you know, what, I have this fleet, but I can't move it because I don't have fuel? You know, um, how, how far do you go on that? And I don't have good answers there, but that has to be kept in mind. Um, so realistic, but not hardcore realism, in my opinion, is the best answer for a, a lot of games. Um, right now. Oh, and what sort of prompting all of this is with, and we'll get to, to look in some more black ice, is the idea that we have so much of these resources here now. Um, is this too much? Probably, but what is the right answer? Okay, now we're going to get to the problems modeling history. And there's a bunch of them. Um, the biggest problem is access to information. Uh, there is a lot of information still out there that has yet to be um, well um, categorized, shall we say, in, in books or formats that are generally available to us as at-home historians. I, I'm saying it that way because those that are going to, you know, um, I don't know if it's the Imperial War Museum, the, um, uh, the British Library or whoever is the record keeper for World War II records, whether British or captured German records, the National Archives is what it is in um, the United States. It's where you would need to go and start reading through paperwork to find out these facts. That's what, you know, only a few people will have the availability, the opportunity to really go and do their research. And of course, it is limited to languages problems. Um, you know, how good is your German? How good is your French? How good is your Dutch? How good is your Russian? Etc. And then we have, you know, accessibilities, how much of it is classified, how much of it is just sort of inaccessible. And then, of course, there's the truly inaccessible of how much of that information is just gone, you know, looking at Germany, just destroyed either, you know, somebody's coming in, you know, bombing your city and destroying records that way, or the great huge amounts of bonfires of paperworks that uh, um, the Germans did at the end of the Second World War. And a good illustration of this is um, I watched the channel See an Arsenal that covers detailed looks at um, uh, firearms, I would say, because you know, they do machine guns, pistols, rifles, all those kind of stuff. Mainly been looking at World War I um, firearms. And they look at the development of the firearm and all, they, all that any of the researchers have access to for the books for for the research and development of the Mauser rifle are the Bavarian records. 
And this is at the time when there was multiple armies in Germany. The German Empire existed, but there was like the Bavarian army, the Prussian army, and one or two others that were sort of um, set up there. And so the trials reports are gone. The, the main trials for it, the some of some models of the um, some of the Mauser rifles, the, like the Gewehr 98 and similar, um, were done by the Prussian Prussians. Well, all of those records are just gone. That presumably destroyed at the end of World War II, as opposed to World War One, but. Those records exist for Bavaria, and in the sense that um, the Bavarians have a, say, a two or three sentence report. Oh well, the Prussians found this out, and they sent us this information. Two or three sentences, and now when the Bavarians are trialing, you know, going out and shooting. Um, you know, a new rifle to see how well it works and its accuracy or its jam or how often it breaks. They have the complete records uh, for Bavaria um, doing that, but they only have a report of what was sort of, you know, the, the conclusions, shall we say, of what was found in Prussia that was sent down to just sort of notify the Bavarians what the Prussians found. Um, so that just as an example of something as major as the development, uh, a lot of the records for the development of the Mauser rifle in Prussia, which was doing the main, you know, drive of it, are just gone. So we can, I can presume that's in many other cases. So records are just gone. So this limits our access. All right, but we can still kind of figure out things. We can, um, oh, and also incorrect information, which we can talk about somebody like the Soviet Union, but. So modeling history is difficult, and especially looking at the grand strategy, because we're not looking at how much um, aircraft um, fuel was available to the Stalingrad front or something like that, you know, this area of operations, or how much um, truck and tank fuel presumably they're burning the same fuel, is available at any given time or how much is being shipped per week. Those records may or may not, I don't know, exist. Um, and whether those can be found out. But for grand strategy game, well, that may give us indications of things, but isn't important because that's just choices being made, either the limitations of the transport infrastructure as much as they could possibly deliver there, say as it might be the thing, or where do we send the oil, you know, the fuel? Um, do we send it up to the north where things are sort of quiet, or do we send it down here where things are, you know, really active and they need it? So um, it's hard to give choices in how to model um, something like fuel, and we will be looking a little at fuel here coming up that's an important um, judgment. Now, according to the documentary The Prize, uh, which also has a book called The Prize, and it talk, and that's sort of in the 20th century, is written towards the end of the 20th century, talking about um, oil in the 20th century. Germany captures about a year of oil for its, um, captures with the fall of France, let me state this as I remember this, at the fall of France, Germany captures oil oil reserves that would equal about a year's worth of um, operational um, needs for the German um, military, the German nation. And um, so I don't know, I mean, they have records, you know, however many hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil or whatever that it was, um, they captured and that was about their use now. Obviously, it's being refined. Some is being used as fuel oil straight into boilers of ships. Others are being refined into you know, air, aircraft fuel and ground fuel. So how do you handle that in a game like this? How do you do that? Well, and, and here is some of the points and why this is important. 
why wouldn't the French player just go, oh, well, I burn all my oil um, the day before I surrender? It's Germans out, Germany's out of its oil. Or, and if you don't realize, quickly click over to resource mode, there's not a lot of oil sources in France. Okay. We're not going to look at this all the time. So there's not a lot of oil sources in France. So what German Germany has captured is um, oil stocks, resources that have been stockpiled. France very well may have a lot of in its colonial empire, and I don't quite know how much between, um, I don't know, Indochina, North Africa, Syria, how much, if much at all, I don't really know how much oil um, France has available at that time. Don't worry about modern day um, drilling. I know there's quite a bit going on in Algeria today. Don't I don't know if they even knew about that. They did. The Italians did not know about all the Libyan oil. Libyan oil. They sort of suspected it, but um, they did not have any locations or any a single oil well producing oil in Libya, as far as I know. They did start um, like around 1940 or something, I think it was, did start active explorations for oil, but did not um, achieve the oil or, you know, have oil um, production going on. So they did not know it. So I don't know where um, particularly France's oil is coming from. I don't know where the Dutch oil is coming from. It's coming from specifically right around here. Um, and so France felt it needed to have a significant oil reserve in case a war breaks out or whatever, um, if their supplies are being cut off for some reason. Germany also builds up a significant oil reserve before the war. How do you model that into a grand strategy war game? Now, you could just say, we'll figure out what it was. And we may have a good idea. I don't, right off the top of my head, have that information. Um, you go, okay. But if you're starting the war before day one of the war, you know, you can, you know, you go, well, September 1939, the game starts. Well, this is one thing I really like about Hearts of Iron 3 and 4, is that they start in 1936. And that's a great, and I did make an episode on a talk on why 1936 is a great year to start the war is that and I talked earlier of course is the back end um, uh, decisions you're making in a grand strategy game and some of them you've got to start years before because that, that takes that long to build a battleship or a carrier and whether you're playing as Germany or you're playing as Italy or you're playing as America when and what do you start building your ships? If you only start building ships the day after Pearl Harbor, you can readily be looking at two years plus before you have a Navy ready. And in that two years, of course, you could have the Japanese landing on your coastline. Now, whether they would successfully be able to hold that coastline, that's another matter if you've lost all of your ships. Realize that. Now, of course, the US doesn't lose all of its ships um, doesn't lose its carriers, and that's what keeps Japan, not that they would have invaded North America um, other than maybe Alaska, which they did do some of those islands up there, they probably would not have made um, invaded the coast of North America, but they very likely, I think, would have invaded um, places like Hawaii without a significant fleet presence, which would have made it immensely more difficult to, um, not impossible by any means, but immensely more difficult to um, contain the Japanese threat and push back against them. So you need to be able to start making the decisions somewhat before the war starts on the conditions. And how do you model, and yes, we have the abilities to, in Hearts of Iron 3, to buy oil and stockpile it. You do not have that ability in Hearts of Iron 4, which I believe is a mistake, and I take that from the prize and knowing how much stockpiles of oil France had, reserves of, of oil, reserves of fuel and reserves of oil. It's a, it's a mix of two. 
those are two different things um, in the game and that Germany was building up a stockpile reserve of oil um, now they do have um, silos and whatnot to to stockpile us to some degree in you know now in hearts of iron four um of course they do have that so there is stockpiling um so i should change that but it's not as simple as it is here so how do you model in stockpiling um because economics are a difficult thing to model into a game such as these so you have choices in stockpiling you have germany i've gone into some of this does not the german nation does not have a, a problem or a difficulty in paying for panzers or paying for artillery um the german economists know that if they dump dump unlimited um amounts of money into armaments building they will um, have the inflationary problems and they've experienced two rounds of hyperinflation so they know they know those problems where germany it's so they don't have problems with they don't have that that problem and we can see that and yes trust me i know various economic models that eventually there will be a problem but for the short term a few years you know less than 10 um you can handle unlimited production because we can see this in the soviet union we can see this in germany we can see this in america we can even see this in britain um but you pay for it years afterwards you know in um various methods so um short term it's not a problem where germany does have a very severe money problem is in dealing with foreign currency because the um, British company that owns oil wells or the Dutch company that owns oil wells, they want money, they want to be paid in the Dutch guilder, the English pound, whatever it may be, the US dollar. Some will take a, you know, a generic currency like the US dollar at this time, um, but they don't want huge amounts of Deutschmarks because they're not buying huge amounts of whether it's resources or whether it's finished goods from Germany. They want, you know, they might, yeah, you know, some, they might be willing to take some, but that's just a drop in the bucket for Germany's needs, what people would take on German currency. So, you know, they got to come up with the gold, with the silver, with the foreign currency, and that is where Germany's having problems because of the um, worldwide economic situation. The U.S. is in a depression. The U.S. doesn't want to buy Leica cameras or um, German-made radios or whatever, because they just don't have their own money. You know, Germany would gladly take U.S. dollars for those products and then use that to buy oil or other, um, and we'll get into some of the other resources here in a, in a while. Uh, will gladly would gladly take us dollars to then buy oil from whether it's the us or somebody else they would gladly do so they just um the us does not have really i mean they have they are buying some that's for sure but not to the scale that germany needs so that's hard to model okay so we have stockpiling to some degree before the war and why is all this important well because it is a very real limitation of operations why why and i'm sure somebody can prove me to some degree wrong but why are we seeing a massive um offense down here in stalingrad you know the, the counter offenses down here but not offenses up here we saw a post um how the soviet union's going in and in, in some recent games going in and wrecking finland um, and that's unhistorical. Uh, I'm not talking for modeling the Winter War. I'm talking the continuation, you know, after Barbarossa. But why aren't they doing that? Well, in my opinion, and I know there's a lack of information, my opinion, a lot of it is limitations of fuel for the Soviets. 
And there also may be limitations of T-34s or uh, soldiers, you know, limitations of other things too. But I do believe it is also the limitations of fuel so that they cannot sustain um, operation, uh, yeah, heavily active operations on, if you will, the three fronts, you know, the north, center, and southern fronts, if you will. They can sustain the operations in limited areas, not everywhere. So you have that. And that's similarly for Germany. On the opposite is the um, you know, uh, Case Blue, I believe it is, the push into the Caucasus, and we'll get to talking about that here in a moment, um, is focused there is not because there aren't panzer divisions or infantry divisions that could be effectively attacking in other areas. It's that you don't have the fuel to, to run all these operations all at once. And this sort of gets back to player expectations and choices. How much do you constrain a player by fuel? by any resource um, should have an effect, I believe entirely, but how much do you do? Right, so how do you model this in? Um, it's a difficulty, and we're going to get to some of the, the stuff, some of the details of some of the, the stuff in a bit, but I want to look at um, some of the choices made um, during the war and or leading up to it, but first during. Now, we have, if you will, 2020 hindsight. We can look back and see, well, you should have done this, you should have done that, and that they didn't have. But that is partially what I, what fascinates me by about World War II or other other wars. We can look at Napoleonic Wars or something, but we're looking at World War II right now. It's not alt histories as in, well, what if the Tsar lived and is ruling Russia or something? Now, I'm not looking at those alt histories. I'm looking at alternate choices in the realms of plausibility, of realistic choices that could have been made. Now, The Germans know a lot about the former Russian Empire and the territories that made up of it. They know a lot about it because you have people like Rosenberg born out there and lived um, early parts of his life out there and others that were sort of the German um, middle class of the Russian Empire and such. You do have people like that. You have continuing contacts with it, so they know they they have a good good idea of what's going on in there um, behind the Soviet curtain. They also have continuing contacts um, in the interwar periods before and after the Nazis come to power. And I'm not going to go into all of them, but they have a good idea. Now, they know they need fuel. They are getting lots of oil, particularly. I don't know how much fuel they're getting, but they're getting lots of oil shipped in after the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact and the conquest of Poland. Uh, it is a continuous supply. I think it is, take, it is maybe hurting the Soviet economy to maintain that level of supply. I just say maybe because I don't know how good of information we have. I don't think there was a lot of extra oil that was effectively being brought out of the ground. Um, because it's not just how much oil is there down in the ground, it's not just how many oil wells there that exist. You have to get that oil out of the ground, you have to store it somewhere, and then you have to move it somewhere, and then once you get it there, you have to store it. So it's an oil infrastructure question, situation. It's not just, is there oil down in Baku? Is there oil up here in Grozny? Yes. There's plenty of oil under the ground. It is no problem, but it's how much is set up to be extracted 
and how much can you deliver to the Soviet economy, which is trying to motorize tractors, trucks, those kinds of things, um, and how much can you deliver to Germany? And Germany is getting a lot. Germany is still constrained in its operational levels, but it's getting a lot. But at any moment, that can be turned off. And ideologically, Hitler needs to attack the Soviet Union. Hitler mistakenly believes that the Soviet Union is going to collapse because it's his Jewish Bolshevism and it's weak and his National Socialism ideology, ideologically will just conquer it. But even if, or they, even believing that, they know it's going to take some time to deal with it. So they know that once they declare war on the Soviet Union, there's a clock ticking. Now, they are dealing with um, slowing that clock ticking down by expanding, and this is, you know, the other um, elements of choices, and which I do like in Hearts of Iron 4, in which you can make military factories, things that make aircraft and tanks, or make civilian um, industry factories that make other industrial capabilities, and you can use those civilian ones, however many you have, to say either make a military factory or make a synthetic oil factory, because Germany has plenty of coal. It can move out of plenty of coal out of the ground. It does have problems um, prioritizing shipping of, or it is, sh sh but I'm um, you know, moving by train, but yeah, sh using um, rail shipments. It does have problems of prioritizing rail shipments. Do you use them for the um, civil population to move around? Rail railways use, do you use it to move, um, uh, I don't know, tank barrels made in Bruno um, up to a tank assembly factory up in Berlin, you know, um, you know, or whatever, you know, or, or um, other, you know, moving of semi-finished goods, you know, proper ready tank gun put into a tank. Do you move those around? You know, do you keep the, the industrial economy hum, humming outside of the oil? Or do you use the, um, the trains to shift divisions around or send supplies to the Eastern Front. You only have so much rolling stock at any given moment. And ger uh, do note, Germany it does the, um, the, um, uh, the um, uh, Krieger engine is it called? Okay, the, the war engine, they do, they, they, set, they set on one standardized um, train engine and just build the crap out of it, make no changes to it. The one thing that Germany makes like America, they don't make any changes to it. Once they got the model set, they don't do any improvements, any changes, you just keep building them out. And that's the one thing, and that, they do a very good job of it. And of course, they're trying to continuously increase the rolling stock, the, the flat cars, the, the tanker cars, the box cars, the passenger cars. They're trying to expand that, including by capturing, but um, they're, so it's both train engines, which are the normally the bottleneck, and the other, the rolling stock that goes along with them, they're, they're during the war, they're massively um, expanding this um, during the war to for train usage. And since trains run on coal, they have plenty of coal, that is not the issue. It might be the issue out, you know, here somewhere, is there enough coal to operate the trains that are able to run there? That might be an issue there. But in the heart of Germany, that is not the issue. Um, fuel is not fu fuel um, you know fuel for trains here is not the issue so there's plenty of coal and the two types of coal Germany has the um, just um, I want to say loose site but that's um, uh, ah, I'm so close to getting the names, but there's two, two uh, a brown and sort of a black coal, um, and it's best to use two different liquefaction um, uh, options for it. And Germany pursues both, and they have factories on both, so you can build synthetic fuel factories. And Germany was doing that about uh, without. Well, they could have done more faster, but within the choices of 
Do you build railway engines or do you build liquefaction plants or do you build tank factories or do you build tanks? You know, those are all choices to be made. What choices do you make? Germany, though, is trying to expand its synthetic oils. It was doing so before the Nazis come into power and it continues all the way during it, expanding that. So we look at choices here. They can, they can have as much liquefied coal as they can process. I mean, the coal isn't the issue. It's the liquefaction of it is, is the issue. Now, Germany does have some oil wells. They do produce some oil, um, but it is a minor amount um, compared to its needs to have a vibrant economy as well as fighting a war. So they do. So how do you model that? Now, here's some of the choices and some of the stuff and how best to model these and, and the problems of modeling this stuff. How much do you allow players to have 2020 hindsight? This is, I was talking to DSAFE, it's been six months or so, I think this, since this topic was coming up. Um, he pointed to uh, pointed me to this that he got it from TIK. Yes, I do watch some of his stuff, and I guess we all do to some degree. Estonian oil shale up in this part of, and we can see some that he's put in here. We don't know how much some of this is, but we talked about it. And he's added some in here that wasn't here originally. Um, you'll see when it's there. Before World War I, but definitely after World War I, um, because before World War I, there isn't much of a need for it. But um, the oil shale is known, and it has started to be exploited by multiple co companies from multiple countries. Estonia, once it's independent, really doesn't have the, um, the economic ability to um, develop the oil field partially by British companies, but starting by the beginning of the 30s or so, very much the Kriegsmarine is looking at the oil from up here. They want to have it, um, is it just, okay, it's that province there, there, and there, I guess, in this game, um, that they want to have it up here and wanted to get it exploited. The problem with it is that it's oil shale. Basically, it's mined. You don't drill and pump it out. You get either people and or machines down there digging it out of the ground. You pull it out of the ground and then basically you squeeze it and um, strain it through to get the oil out because it is it's like sort of like a clayish muddish sort of thing I my understanding and it it's up there and so the Germans are dealing with this now it's a process and setup that is not profitable generally speaking because whether it's out in um, the Dutch East Indies, in places like Pennsylvania and Texas, in the United States, in places like Iran, in places like Baku, um, in places like Iraq, and I think they're also you know, like finding it in, in Mexico. Yeah, definitely in Mexico, there's large oil reserves that they are exploiting, and I think down in places like Venezuela, they can get it out of the ground cheaply in a good um, usable um, state and readily ship it around the world. But like the Kriegsmarine who wants oil for its ships can't necessarily get oil coming in because they don't know um, if Italy's going to be an ally or not, if they're going to change sides or not. I mean, they changed sides in World War I, they were part of the Central Powers, but they go, oops, nope, we're not going into this, and then later, oh, yes, we are coming into the war, but on the other guy's side. And, of course, they changed sides in World War II as well. So, um, there, 
they're worried about um, availability of oil. So it is, in essence, subsidized exploitation. You can get it cheaper somewhere else, but they're going to set up the companies to um, make it happen for if it if a war breaks out, Germany will have access to it. Now, obviously, I think most of you watching know the history. The Soviet Union comes in and takes over this area. They get the um, the oil shale in. Um, oh, and much of the um, electricity in. Um, Estonia, at least in some of the major electric plants, are just burning the oil shale. They're, they're not even refining it. They're just hauling it out of the ground, putting the mud into you know, some sort of furnaces, burning it, and um, you know, clearing out the muck afterwards or whatever, and just dealing with it that way, sort of like, using it sort of like coal um, to generate electricity. So they're just using the oil shale itself and not... Um, um, trying to refine it into other sorts. So it is helping the Estonian economy directly. And for that, it's probably useful, um, cheaper than bringing in, shipping in foreign oil for them. But that's just a minor amount. Well, what happens is, okay, the Soviets get a hold of it. Well, there's a war that happens, you know, Barbarossa. And uh, the Soviets are retreating, and the Soviets largely destroy the infrastructure of the mine setting up. Not that it's unusable, not that you can't get any more out of it, but its production capacity has probably been estimated, I don't know, somewhere like 10 or 20 percent um, by the time the Germans get there and get control of it. They can still get some out, still a useful amount, um, locally at least, but not very much. Most of it's destroyed. And so this, of course, happens in 1941. They get a hold of this. Well, what do the Germans do? Well, they set up the Baltish Oil GmbH um, company that manages all of this stuff. And from there, promptly do basically nothing. Um, yeah, they, they run it. They run what they can um, of it. But they, you know, they put, they put, whatever is back, whatever that isn't destroyed, they put back into use, but it's at a very, very low level. The Ger and like I was saying earlier, the Germans knew about this. They were the ones setting up earlier companies to exploit this. This was very much on their radar. But what they see, and this is where we're going to get down to modeling some of the stuff, they see this as the goal. So when in 1941, they, the Soviet Union does not collapse and they get pushed back. Their 1942 offensive is to capture the oil down here and, and put their resources into building tanks or aircraft or whatever. And so they do the drive for here. They, you know, they get um, the MICOP oil, I believe, um, here. Now, how do you... They don't get the Grozny, they don't get the Baku. But would they have ever gotten those? Yes, possibly. I mean, if you make other choices. They, there's, in my opinion, Stalingrad was very winnable by the Germans. They just got fixated on the, um, the city and lost sight of the goal. The goal was to um, cut off Soviet access to this part of the world effectively and its primary access to my knowledge is either a railway running down this there is one i believe on this side of the river on um, the volga as well as the volga itself um, and that comes down here there is very little infrastructure and capabilities of coming out of here to the point that if you cut off all of this you eventually cut off the Soviet Union's effective um, access to oil. And that is a big thing. The Germans fail to do that. They get fixated on taking Stalingrad instead of 
Okay, well, you can have Stalingrad. I know they, because they almost got it. They almost got it, and it was just down to one little pocket on the edge, and it got turned around eventually. So they almost had it, yes, and it was just a little bit more. You know, it's reinforcing failure as opposed to going, oh, shit, this sucks. Let's get out of this city. Let's get our panzers or our infantry divisions moving around and cutting off the city. They didn't want another um, Leningrad, a, you know, a besieged city holding out forever. Um so I understand some of the thought behind it, but they lost sight of the goal, cutting off, you know, securing the northern flank of the push down here and focused on that. But I watched a, now, if they'd come made it down here, would they have had all the oil they need? No. This was somewhat of an illusion. Yes, there was oil down here. Yes, there were systems to move the oil out because there is not a lot of industry down here. There's a lot of oil and a lot of moving of oil. The Soviet Union um, had ordered the placing of explosives, I think dynamite, but we'll go with just explosives, all over the, um, the industry, while the industry was keeping going. They, the guy in charge of it is ordered to, and they do, they place um, explosives on basically all the oil wells, on all of the pipe, local pipelines, all of the um, rail infrastructure, everything down there involved in getting oil out was going set to detonate. They never have to detonate because the Germans never get anywhere near close enough, but it is set to go. I don't think the Germans perceive this as a reality, and had they blown that, well, fighting oil fires is a very hard and difficult process. John Wayne made a very good movie on it, and that's with more modern techniques than what they had then. Um, it is quite possible that it would have been a generation, you know, 20 years, to put that oil fire out. It is quite possible, I don't know, that they still couldn't have put it out. There is an oil fire somewhere in California, out in this part of California somewhere, that's been going for like, I don't know, 50, 60 years. There's um, sort of like oil shale or whatever down there. Um, and an oil fire got caught. It got caught in. It went underground. And it's just going. You can't even live in that part of it. They had to evacuate it. You go in the ground, just sort of smokes. Because there's down below, there's just enough oxygen down there that keeps the fire going. And it's it's well deep, and it's it, you know, and not, it's very and well. They think, they think oil well, but it's deep enough, but not too deep, so that it can get that oxygen, and it keeps it burning, and it just keeps it burning, and it's sort of it's not like one big. Um, you know, big juicy um, deposit of oil. It's all sort of spread out. So it's just constantly burning. And it's like 50, 60 years. And there's just, they don't yet really have a way to put it out. And it's an oil fire um, that's gotten underground and just, they have yet to be able to put it out. And it's still burning. And it's been there like 50, 60 years. And there's no plans to do anything about it. They just let it burn. Um, so I don't know if, depending on how the oil fire goes, if it spreads to the underground deposits or not. I don't know. Um, I don't know the, the local conditions well enough to know if that is even a practical thing. Meaning, because you need not only fire, heat, you also need the fuel, but the fuel is the oil and oxygen. If you don't have the oxygen, it don't burn. Um, that's how they normally put oil fires out, of course, is denying it oxygen, but another, another thing. Um, but the infrastructure would have been destroyed. So even if the Germans got the oil fires out, where the hell are they going to, how are they going to get that, um, the fuel out? The, the Soviets are going to destroy the, the infrastructure. They're going to destroy any ships in the Caspian Sea that move it. They're going to, or try to hide them you know, on the other coast here. They're going to destroy the rail infrastructure. So it's going to take considerable time for the um, oil to be put back in a, um, you know, to get the oil from, you get the oil from here to Berlin. 
or where, wherever else you're going to refine it into a useful nature. Because other than large ships, you need to refine the oil into fuel. Um, ships can burn um, the oil itself. Uh, they don't need, they need, the cleaner the oil, the better. Little straining is, is best, but a light, sweet crude is just fine to burn it. Uh, but after, I don't know, three months, six months, you've got to take the ship in to, um, to port and let it all cool down and get people in there with um, scrapers and scrape out the, the buildup of deposits. But um, where if you have it well um, refined oil, but it's still oil and you burn that, um, very little and you can run it for years without having to do that. Um, it just depends on how much you want to do it. So, like I say, the Germans know about this. So to give some history is, with the failure at Stalingrad, on March 16th, 1943, so the beginning, near the beginning of March of 43, Goering orders Baltish Oil GmbH to actively start expanding, to start expanding the um, mining of oil shale. So they knew it was there. They made a choice not to exploit it other than clean up the mess and whatever working equipment and setup you can um, keep it working. Um, but they, but no, no additional resources given to them. On the 21st of June, 1943, so now halfway through 1943, Himmler orders the sending of a, many as they could Jews and other prisoners up there to be worked, um, to you know get picks and shovels up there to get the oil shale out. So this is too late. They could have made these choices you know, some of them evil, obviously, but made these choices in, you know, um, well, you could make, well, obviously you could be making some of them before you invade the Soviet Union, but by what, September, November, um, this area is in German hands and they can evaluate the situation. They could be then, so let's just say November 41, they could make the decision to start to start to rebuild the damaged infrastructure. So that would have been a year and a half earlier that you could have put get this thing into operations. And this is at a time when Germany has a lot more effective resources. America's not yet in the war. They're, um, yes, they're British bombings, but not to the level that the Americans are going on you have it. And realizing that June, you know, mid-June 43, by February 44, so just about six months later, the Soviet offensive up here in Narva starts. And this is just out in this area, some of it's here. And later in 44, um, I'm not sure the exact date, about 200 um, special oil specialists of some sort are evacuated in, down into Germany. I guess the rest of the people are just left to whatever. Um, so they, they've lost it by September 44. It lost Tallinn and whatnot. I mean, they've lost this whole area by September 44. So they have less than a year. So effectively, this there it doesn't change any of the... It doesn't affect the... Except for maybe negatively in that you send resources up there, but you don't really get the payoff of any significant more oil. Um, to your war effort, but do you allow players to make alternate choices? I don't mean alt because alt history is often you know, um, you know what what if um, you know there's a fascist leader in France or something like that, and France is allied with Germany and against Britain and everybody else. I'm talking about alternate choices that are realistic and are knowable you know like of course yeah we'll you know it's 1936 we'll start drilling out here for oil in the oil fields yeah of course we would you would just want to make those choices but those weren't known at the time we're talking about something here that was known not something that was unknown that could have been exploited no they knew it was here they knew there was oil here they knew there was some oil base to it says so we know that there's oil here we know they could exploit it we know they can get a lot more out of it and they would have done so 
So this is some of the hard elements to model in for it. Now, and this shows we've been looking at oil. How do you model it in? What choices do you give? How should this be driving your, your war? I know this is going for a long time, but I'm looking at the details. Hopefully it's interesting. This is also where we're coming in here. They've often taken it as a slur, but I don't necessarily mean it. So the, the Black Ice team is trying to make Hearts of Iron 3 more like Hearts of Iron 4. Obviously, we have rare materials. Those could be rubber, those could be nickel, those could be tungsten, whatever. They're a material that is rare. You look at um, copper here. Copper is useful for many, many things. Commonly, it is used um, as a conductive element in for electricity for like wires. It is a combination of flexible and well conductive. Um, I think gold may be the best, but gold's expensive because it's even rare. Um, Copper is also useful because it is a reasonably soft metal that in com combination with, uh, do they have tin here? I don't think so, but you could put it with zinc, I think as well, and make brass. Uh, I think you do do a mix of copper and zinc to get brass. Germany has a severe copper shortage in internally. So does the Soviet Union. They both have severe. Um, no, I. Well, this is what I do here. They both have severe um, copper shortages. Soviet ammunition to this day, or Russian ammunition to this day, is um, a lot of the casings are made with steel, a mild steel, because of their copper shortage. Where the U.S. has plenty of copper, Africa has lots and lots of copper. So it's not a copper shortage, generally speaking. It is a uh, a local shortage, not worldwide. Like gold would be, I would say, as a worldwide shortage. That's why it's so valuable. We use it both as a holding of what of you know wealth, gold coin, gold ring, as well as a because um, jewelry is a as a wealth holding. Uh, instrument as well as in like um, computers or whatever today we're using gold as a industrial metal as well but and to the point that germany tries and we have some reports of it tries to get as much copper back from the front as they can, often in the form of, um, you know, artillery casings, artillery, not the um, the back, not the part that goes out the barrel, but the back. Um, they also try to get the baskets because all the all the ammunition sent out in the basket, you know, in a weaved basket, you know, one basket per round, is sort of the standard for a lot of it, and so that's how they you know ship them and you know, I say you know it's not like a. Um, a girl's basket or whatever you hold it it's a it's a basket weave thing that's ran, you know a, a cylinder that has a opens top and bottom they try to get these things back um they request them back um some generals are noted for in their that their division is sending a lot of them back um and i think i think it's a mixed mixture of habit meaning does the general care and or the officers care and specifically try to collect the baskets and or the shells and put them and take them back to the depots and get them loaded on the trains after they you know unload the, the new ammunition do they load up the old and send it back i think it's a mixture of do they care and do they do it enough as well as the circumstances of the front winning or losing or whatever um so how do you um manage recycling but germany does come up with like the like russia in using you know other materials than copper for the you know um 
particularly you really sort of best to use copper for the actual projectile, though it's not required. It really reduces down wear by doing that. But the casing, soft, soft metal, soft um, steel, soft iron, um, is doable so that you can get away with a lot of stuff without that you would like to use copper for, without but without um, uh, you know without using copper, you know, using steel or something else. And so they've implemented these things here. And generally speaking, um, and how do you, <sighs> copper shortage level three is 5% supplies down. How do you come up with that number? I don't know. And I don't know, I mean, I'm, I think they're just guesstimating. And this comes down as to how do you model this in? I don't know. But we can make wild wild ass guesses. I, I would want to say informed in guesses, informed guesses. And they might come to that level because, yeah, you can tell I've read a bunch on the subject, looked at documentaries, those kinds of things. But I am far from an expert on it. There's more I want to read up on it. We'll be doing so. But these are good ideas. Now, what I do see with Hearts of Iron 4, though, is the problem of overly severe um, negative effects, maybe, because we do see alternate metals, alternate, and if you're not talking metals, um, alternate materials uh, being used in the war on multiple sides um, for things. So both Germany and America are heavily into synthetic rubbers. They're developing them in, very much in joint with each other. Standard Oil and um, IG Farben are both in partnership to develop synthetic rubbers of various types. Um, obviously, at some point politically, they have to separate, but um, up and basically up until the war starts, they're um, they're in bed together. Um, IG Farben is also trying to make synthetic fuels where standard oil, well, they're the standard oil, they like oil, um, but they're trying to use oil or whatever to make synthetic rubber. So they're on that thing. So I don't know how big of a restriction these should be. Now, what is sort of digging into the depths of this, other than just talking about resources and history and the idea of modeling them into the game, we're looking now a little bit more at black ice from Hearts of Iron 3, obviously, with these effects. Okay, I'm not going to quibble at this point because I just don't have information to quibble. Um, uh, tungsten shortage. Yeah. Um, should heart attack be down by 15%? I don't have good information to quibble on that. Um, supply throughput. You know, I don't know. This is something here. Well, I guess you can get the um, strategic resource. I have not um, in this game. Uh, synthetic plant or no synthetic rubber production plant would be the, the one to do to I presume to get rid of this um, rubber shortage effect. So they do have this. Now, what and this is to some degree, this whole talk is defense of Third Reich events, disabling the trading of these. I disable the trading of these as the game. It is very easy. In fact, just deleting one file, it is very easy to put it back in the game. But why do I want to disable it? This is sort of coming into this. Um, and we're going to illustrate this. Oh, let's go back to fuel before we, we go off fuel. The other thing, um, modeling. And it does to, to a degree, and we can see it here, is um, 
uh, supply throughput. Here I'm taking this to be lack of truck tires to move stuff around by trucks because lack of rubber is not affecting railways. Uh, there are probably some rubber can be used in making of train engines, but most all the critical parts I don't I don't think it's overly uh, overly um, significant. So I don't think it affects moving anything by rail. I think it's purely by trucks, which is fuel. TRE for Germany has a wood gas effect that comes in that, again, I'm just going 10% extra for wood gas. Wood gas is um, and you can, I think, also use coal. Um, yeah, you can use coal because I'm just getting ready to do it. They used to have in Britain and other places in Europe and I think in parts of America as well, what they called town gas, town gas. That's sort of, you know, the gaslight era, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes and all that stuff. What they would do is they would have a plant um, that they would bring um, coal into and burn it, and the gas, gas would come off of it, and they would capture that gas and put it through the pipes through a city, and then people could light it on fire and have gas lighting in their housing, houses or street lamps, the, um, that sort of period. And so yes, you can do it from coal or you can do it from wood, wood. So when you burn them, so what you can see is they would have a burning chamber that you would put your wood or your coal in, you would burn it, gas would come off of it, it would be captured in another bigger container, normally under not terribly much um, compression and then fed into the internal combustion engine that would work. Now um, you will find some pictures of German tanks set up for wood gas. Some of them I believe were specifically for testing. Most are purely for training because again to illustrate it um, a lot of the buses either internally within a city or um, between cities, between towns, buses in Germany were converted over to wood gas. One of the sort of anecdotes is going between town A and town B, there was a steep part of one road. Well, wood gas is not very combustible as compared to either like natural gas or um, uh, gasoline, you know, fuel, um, uh, petroleum, um, petrol, whatever you want to call it in various um, countries. It's not as combustible, but it is combustible. So the bus would get and not be able to make the climb. So all the passengers would get out and those young and fit enough would get behind the bus and push it up this hill for however many yards or meters or whatever. And they'd get to the top of it and then everybody would get back on the bus and onward they would go. This is just illustrating that the bus normal running, and you can convert it back after once you get fuel supplies coming in again, but under normal circumstances could make this road easy. It's just too difficult. So it's not something you can readily convert for frontline use. But what is important here, fuel is used to keep your economy going. It gets workers from their home to their place of work, the, the bus. Now you can set up, um, you know, uh, coal-based systems, but you know, um, because you can generate, you can burn coal, generate electricity, and use, um, you know, electric tram cars or whatever, sure. Um, but you can use buses, you can use trucks to deliver goods either from the factory to the railroad, you know, um, uh, train stations, or from the train stations to the factory. Sometimes major factories would have trains and be able to just come right into their factory. But still, you can move it around. So it keeps your economy going. So this is another thing that is difficult to um, think it's like a hundred thousand. I know I said in the event for it, German vehicles of various types get converted to wood gas during the war. Basically at the start, 
basically there's no wood gas. Well, this also happens, in, and I, there is an effect for um, Britain as well. I know this is a major thing up in Finland because they have lots of trees that they can do. I don't know how much it was done in Italy because they have a, a then they knew about it then, fairly large supply of natural gas, and it is to a limited effect, but I don't know how much in occupied France. But in Germany, there's about, I think it's like 100,000 vehicles of various types, you know, whether privately owned passenger cars, you know, somebody who had one, or whether, um, and they, I've even seen pictures of it done to like a motorcycle with sidecar. Can't quite do it effectively on a, on a regular motorcycle. Need a little extra space. But if you're doing a little local delivery business or whatever, um, or running, you know, messages around or mail, you know, rapid mail delivery as they might, you know, days before email, but something more than a telephone conversation, but running around, you may want to have a little motorcycle that has a, you know, a sidecar kind of thing that converted to wood gas. So that is something that I do try to model into it that is harder to quantify as how much that affects the situation. Okay, back to these strategic effects. Should you be able to trade them? Germany has some of these here, but some of these they're not getting, and I sort of kind of think they should um, because we can see here our shortages does have zinc surplus um, and it has aluminum surplus for a while um, and yes we can create some events and black ice does have some of them to Germany get control of the mines um, but this may be oh well yeah, this is being controlled by our um, chromite. Uh, okay, they have is because this is a puppet. So they do have control, I think, from controlling puppets, but not um, uh, from allies. So obviously, we'll move into here and get control of these and get the effects for manganese. Um, and they control some. Now, trading of resources and these. The game wants to, the Black Eyes people want to make sure that you can trade these. I would be fine with trading to some degree, but I like the old system that within, within the faction. Um, Let me give you a bit of a story and why I, because we already have these rare materials. You can already trade rare materials. You want to stockpile or trade rare materials. You can already do so. How and why do I think this is different? And I do think this is different. During the Spanish Civil War, you may know the story, basically, um, there's a coup attempt. Uh, the radicals are in charge of the government, and they're sending out death squads to um, forces that are not in agreement with the government, including the church and others, sending out death squads, often made up in the local police department, but they take off their uniform. Um, and so there's people being killed, often being left bullet-ridden somewhere randomly around the city. Um, one general is arrested, uh, I forget his name, a prominent general um, in Spain, very popular. Um, he's arrested. The next morning he is found in the street with bullets. Somebody says, oh, he tried to escape. He wouldn't have. They, the, and it was the police that came and arrested him. So the police department arrests a general. He ends up dead. That prompts, and this, this, you know, people often nowadays look back and go, oh, it's the, you know, Franco wanted to do a coup against the government. No, he didn't. The, just the government was killing off the people that weren't in agreement with the government. And one of them was a, um, a general. So the generals tried to do a coup against the government, which fails. And then, and only then, um, does Franco get in charge, in, in, um, 
in action with it because he is in internal exile down here well one of these islands he you know he's forced to be down here um there's actually the, they get a british pilot to um in an airplane you know just a private guy to fly down and he doesn't even know what, at first what the job is no it's to go get somebody or something but gets him and flies him i think over to here where franco has um troops that he's led before and then the germans come in uh, while the civil war is already breaking out in spain um, people are choosing sides already germany um brings a bunch of ju um 52s i believe yeah ju 52s uh, the, the trimotors down here and flies up um franco's army or at least elements of it to get in here so germany gets involved in this war Germany starts selling arms and munitions. Just to define the two, arm is something like a, uh, a rifle or artillery piece, and munition is what comes out of those, okay, to define the two different things. They're selling both, um, including munitions in the Spanish caliber that they're making. Well, to pay for this, two companies are set up. One in Spain called, um, or the initials are HISM. I think I have that right written down here. H, in its, in its abbreviation, HISM. And they control or get control um, of purchasing, because they don't necessarily own, but they get control of purchasing all, either all resources, um, if you will. Um, or refined resources, you know, basically steel, you know, or iron, you know, refined iron or refined steel or tungsten, you know, this warfarin, same same thing, two different names for the same thing, warfarin or um, other rare materials. In here, they are purchasing. They have there. There is some trade with Spain. I don't know, but but basically, this is a sort of government-approved monopoly of a Spanish company that is the under the during the Spanish Civil War the only company that's allowed to buy these things now they I'm sure any any that um, can be used to effectively uh, go into a you know a, um, a rifle manufacturer you know um, in Spain you know to make rifles for the Spanish they're getting the steel that they need but any extra that isn't immediate need to use by the nationalists in their war effort all goes to this company Germany sets up a company called Rorak R O W A K, and again, those are initials of longer thing that buys all of the stuff that comes from the Spanish company and they exports it to Germany. And it, this is set up as a legal framework. As time goes on and as they um, capture more areas from the Republicans, Germany is sending down specialists to examine these new resource uh, elements, whether it's a, you know, steel is a, is a product. It is a product of normally coal and iron, which is a refined um, element coming out of the ground once you, you know, refine it into iron, not just in its sort of red rust form, but into it, you know, what we think of as metal um, and is combined. So it goes through a, a significant industrial process. So whether it's something coming out of an industrial process or out of a mine like coal or whatever, they come down and examine the conditions and um, oversee the production setup. So the Germans are, are coming in and controlling how these companies are operating. They're controlling it in nationalist Spain. Franco is very happy with this at first because um, he Germany is selling him, not giving him, selling him his arms and munitions. Uh, Again, an aside, hopefully this is interesting. A buddy of Goering's, 
um, I know somebody looked it up on one of the chat, um, eventually gets three ships. And he is um, the guy who's selling, um, he's buying the arms in, in Germany, putting them on his ships. They're flagged normally by some other country and smuggling them into Spain. You know, the, the higher, German hierarchy knows this is obviously going on and all, but um, he's doing that. This is going so well. He gets three more ships, sends them to the Republicans. He's supplying both sides. And yes, the Germans know this. Um, so, But it's, this is all for money for both sides. So this is a profitable industry for Germany. Now, um, Franco realizes as you know, time goes on that these Germans are getting these resources cheap. I could sell them for more to somebody else and then use that to buy, use, you know, have even more money to buy more weapons from Germany or whatever it might be. Well, basically he gets informed, well, yeah, you can um, certainly sell, you can change the, the legal setup and sell these resources to other countries. We're not going to sell you any more arms. We, we won't care if you have more money. We're, we, we will stop selling you any arms if you stop our current agreement of allowing us to buy resources cheaply. I'm not, I'm not saying without a profit. I don't know if there's profit involved, what, how that all goes, but it's cheap for the Germans. And Franco has a quick little think and goes, nope, nobody else is going to sell me weapons, at least not in any scale that the Germans are. So nope, you keep getting your resources cheaply. And so functionally, while this is going on, Germany controls, in essence, controls Spanish industry because, you know, does steel go to um, a bicycle manufacturing or go to Germany? No, it'll go to Germany. Does steel go to a rifle manufacturer or to Germany? Oh, go to a rifle manufacturer because Franco needs rifles or whatever. So it's, you know, it's the decisions are being met, made up by the Germans on this. Now, I, this continues after the World War II breaks out, but of course for, you know, um, the situation changes. I don't know how it changes um, post Spanish Civil War, just what's going on. Um, um, after a while, especially after the fall of France, Germany sets up um, a different agreement with Portugal for um, primarily, again, tungsten, not exclusively. But there, as far as I know, the Germans are not controlling it. So to me, the definition of why these are not tradable and why, why modeling these in this, I, I do like what they've done here, it, it to some degree. I really wish, well, I don't know, what I would be willing to do, though I, to me, money is meaningless in this game. Um, outside, to me, in this game, and the um, Hearts of Three, uh, Hearts of Iron Three and Hearts of Iron Four developers agree with me on this, Money is only used in Hearts of Iron 3, and it is used for international exchanges, and is not used in Hearts of Iron 4, which I think is a mistake, because you very well may sell your product to one country, you know, um, sell radios to America, and then use the US dollars to buy oil from Iran. R Iran might not want um, radios, because it doesn't have enough electricity to have radios in the homes, but they want US dollars and they're going to use US dollars to buy something from Britain, you know, uh, trucks or something from Britain. I don't know. Um, so I really wish money was in Hearts of Iron 4, but purely as an international means of exchange. So to me, this is control this, the, the special effects. The idea here, again, Germany was in essence controlling Spain's resources. Here, Germany is controlling, because this is a puppet, Croatia's resources or Slovakia's resources or directly conquered and occupied resources. Um, 
like up here, you know, however much um, uh, heavy water is useful. If you're going with a nuclear program, obviously it would be, um, or what is out here. Um, oh, well, this is an academy. Uh, does it say, oh, this is another national. Okay, I guess there's not a lot of special resources in here. But if they'd come out here and controlled um, well, pharmacy industry, these are industries, keep running into industries. Okay, I guess these are mostly industries. Um, but if you come out and end up controlling these or should be some out here probably, or coming down here and controlling these industries. This to me is you're controlling and with this and you have the, uh, the ability to expand the resources. So to me, this is controlling copper, controlling manganese, not trading for it. This is trading for it and these effects. So unless you're going to go all the way into Hearts of Iron 4 territory of having these instead of just generic rare material, you know, where do you break it out? And with resource substitution, softer metals instead of copper, you know, it gets gets to be a, a bit much. But that and looking at Spain as why I think these should not be a traded, definitely should not be traded outside of faction members. And inside of faction members, still sort of don't think they I don't know um, because money is just not useful what the hell is Germany or what the hell is Italy going to do with a bunch of um, German money so let's just say there's a um, there's more chromite more chrome um, than Italy needs let's just say there is I don't know, but let's just say there is. There's more chrome than than Italy needs. And Germany wants to buy it, so they spend money on it. What purpose does Italy need the money for? It can... And I know there's various pay soldiers, pay bill bullshit you can pay soldiers forever well no you can pay soldiers for five or ten years and just have that money go into bank accounts you know or largely and paying the rent at home and whatnot so you really don't you really you know there's inflation but you see during war you just make a law that says you can't raise the rent so there's no inflation on the rent so even though the the guy who's getting the because the, the problem is is the the landlord who, you know, the, the soldier's family at home, you know, is, the soldier's pay is going to pay his rent. The, the landlord gets this money and he walks out of, oh, got the money. Uh, there's nothing to buy because so many things are rationed. Um, but if they weren't rationed, oh, well, I want that, um, uh, those imported cigarettes. Well, that would be inflationary because they're not importing enough cigarettes for everybody say so the price would skyrocket and you'd have inflation and the guy you know would just be a problem well that's why you put rationing in charge and price controls so that like in britain they do not ration beer i think don't think they ration beer um but i do think they put a price control on it think sorry I could be wrong on that but um, you can post below if you know um, so they may not the the pub may not have beer for you but it's price controlled and you can drink as much as you have money for and so it's there is a supply but the demand um, you know you the, the pub owner can't just keep 
raising the price as it's a fixed price. So the pub owner can decide to ration it, meaning he has extra beer in back, but he's going to sell it tomorrow and not today because he wants to keep his pub open every day uh, kind of thing um, instead of running out of beer until he gets another shipment. And he, you know, So some things may not be rationed in, in different countries at different times. And for a short period of time, five years or less for sure, 10 years, I think so, you can handle the idea of rationing and restricting of it and rent controls and all of that and handle the economy. So internally, money is unimportant. You can tell Beretta or Krupp or whatever and say, okay, yes, um, more workers. Okay, here's money for the workers. Oh, you want you know money? And they just fill their bank accounts. The companies fill their bank accounts. They pay their employees. They pay for their resources. But everyone's just filling bank accounts with money, you know, not necessarily actually printed. It's just, you know, put up on tallies, um, you know, in, in bank accounts. So um, these companies, if you're on the winning company, country in war and you haven't been bombed, you may come out rich. And then the government's going to have to, to pay for this. But short-term money is meaningless. So why would you need, why, what would Italy do with German money or gold or whatever as money? Uh, are they going to buy stuff from Switzerland? Buy stuff from Spain? Eh, maybe in Spain, yeah. But eventually the idea is Germany isn't going to sell anything to Italy that Germany needs to fight the war that, that Italy would want to fight its war. You know, it, it would just, you know, may do transactions on paper. Sure, you want, you know, I think it was about 200 or more Stukas were sent down in parts and assembled in Italy. Um, Stuka dive bombers. So they were, you know, assembled in Italy, but all the parts were made in Germany. Um, and so that was sort of cheaper for the Italians as well as cheaper for the Germans because the labor to assemble them uh, wasn't, you know, the Germans didn't need to do that part of the labor. The Italians provided that part of the labor. So, um, you know, and it's, I would say more likely it was, hey, Italy needs some dive bombers. Germany goes, well, we're producing five dive bombers a day or 10 dive bombers a day. We can't produce anymore and we need all that we need. But, oh, we're producing all these parts, engines, propellers, crankshafts, you know, pieces of, you know, stamped aluminum. It's the, you know, it's the assembly work is taking too much time. Oh, well, we'll send the parts down to you and you can assemble them in one of your factories. We'll even send down for 20 or 30 days, 10 people to show your people how to put them together and whatnot and get it so they put them together. So using the labor. So that's really more, I would say, of resource exchange than um, anything else. So I don't know about this trading aspect. Um, and so these I take as control and the lack of controlling a certain amount of these resources, key ones, means um, you don't, um, you have negative effects. Germany did get to where it was controlling, though they don't put it in up here, uh, a nickel. Um, and there um, is a bit of controversy here. Um, the lead um, developer of Black Ice has said no to putting in the uh, Petsamo um, nickel mines up here as a nickel resource for um, the axis, but it probably should be by the scale of it, actually. Um, Germany does put a lot of, inclu including after the winter, before, but definitely after the winter war, um, do, does a lot of work in expanding the nickel development up there and getting it out and shipping it for German use. So I look at it as control of the resources, not trading of the resources. So back to sort of one of the one of the two things is how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? Rare materials. Now, if you notice this, this is nine nine nine. That's the max, and it will max out. And then, so if you if I got if I capture more of any of these things here, the extra just disappears. 
And depending on your usage, I don't know, and someone could do the math, how many days it, let's just say, because we are trading for some, um, traded for some, changes by 100, okay, well, 300. Four years, three years, two years, I don't know, two years or more of rare materials or something before we go dry at this rate. And this is with almost 800 ICs currently. We can see the various penalties that we're facing. Some are more or less permanent. Some are like the unit spawn will go away in a little while. Um, so rare materials aren't very rare. Steel is as much as we want. Coal, coal, Germany, that's fine, because Germany has the coal. Yeah, I know Germany had coal shortages, but that's more of a transportation, like I said, problem than an end result. Oil, well, I mean, the problem we have here is, really with this game, is fuel gets sent out and gets in the system and gets because we can see that we are putting currently um 700 some into the system and 1700 is being returned to the stockpile meaning it was sent to somewhere not needed and then returned home um, and so we're getting a lot back, but that won't always be the case. But what will happen is huge amounts will get stuck in the system out here in the Soviet Union. At least that's been my experience. So we will have fuel shortages um, that can be partially alleviated by more oil production. Um, so oil does become an issue eventually here. So I don't know. I don't know how this should be done. I would, uh, you may, well, why did you make a video if you don't know? Well, I wanted to talk about resources in World War II and grand strategy and how much should you limit? How much should you be able to stockpile like before the war? It should be a factor in your operations. But I really do believe, and you know, I, I'm agreeing with TIK. He doesn't know who I am to, to agree with me, so I'm agreeing with him. That, because I've watched some of his, he put more effort, than, or more time into making the videos, I haven't watched all of them, of his Stalingrad campaign stuff. But you know, well, why don't you just send some more divisions down there and whatnot? Well, he comes back with, They couldn't send more divisions and supply those divisions, I think would be his answer. Meaning, yeah, you could put more you put more divisions on trains and send those divisions there, which would mean fewer supplies for the divisions already there, because you're, those trains aren't moving supplies, they're moving other troops and tanks and artillery pieces into, into there. And then once you get the more divisions there, they don't have enough supplies for the divisions already there. So bringing more in doesn't improve the situation. It could actually make the situation worse. There, I totally agree with them. And there is often the problem. Now, I've not gotten very far in Hearts of Iron 4 for various reasons that now have railways. And I really want to look into that and see how that works, especially once you're getting in here with railways and how much that there may be, hey, you've got 10 divisions down here, three of them armored. I don't want to send any more divisions because I just don't have the supplies for them here, whether it's fuel supplies or general supplies, because here now I may have plenty of fuel, plenty of, of supplies back here, but it's here I don't have it. And I may have a reasonable amount here, but I just out here. See, this is the question as earlier on, and I'm going to wrap this up very soon, um, 
as going back to Germany capturing a year's worth of fuel from in nineteen in like June nineteen forty or July now. Let's go let's go July nineteen forty in France to operate for a year. Okay, that puts you to to 1941 and Germany already had a stockpile of fuel and it's expanding its fuel um, production facilities inside Germany. It's producing all the oil it knows how to produce out of the ground and um, it's actually exploring for more oil but um, uh, spoiler they don't find any more oil so it's wasted effort um, but they're producing all that they can get out of the ground. They're doing synthetic factories, and they're getting oil shipped in from the Soviet Union. So they've got a year's worth of oil, but they're maybe, and especially in 1940, they're getting almost what they need with the Soviet deliveries. Maybe not what they need, but almost what they need. So for a year, year and a half, maybe out to two years, Germany has enough oil capacity with, you know, with all, you know, of course, you also have Ploetz Sea producing oil without the Allies bombing things, you know, bombing your synthetic plants, bombing Ploetz Sea. It has enough to do it. It's often the getting the fuel to where it needs to on the front is the problem. Is maybe more of the problem often, and I think railways are going to be a wonderful thing in trying to model that. Well, I hope this was interesting. It's something I wanted to talk about, and I don't know about, you know. If you're playing Black Ice, especially rare materials, you should, and, I, and I, I've, I've done two playthroughs now, one um, current Black Ice, basically just Black Ice, another with TRE, and I guess a third one now with TRE and some of the other ones, um, you know, GGA and whatnot. Do not try to build up too much rare materials. You will capture huge amounts, particularly in the Netherlands, particularly down in France but in other places, rare materials that more than once I well pegged out to, you know, going to 99. Sure, I'm using more than, than that. So meaning that um, you're going to, ca you're going to capture in, in a few of these places almost, if not actually enough to go to max out in 1940. So if you can start the war and just have, you know, 10, 20,000 of this max, you'll have enough to, to work for the time and just conquer. Just you're, you're getting enough. Um, conquer it and then then worry about importing it. So don't worry too much. You know, don't go to negatives. Keep enough, but don't build. Don't try to build a big stockpile of it. Now, oil is a different matter, as you can see here. So building a stockpile of oil is different, but building a stockpile of rare materials and you just you don't you don't want to go too low but you don't need to build as many as i have last couple of games of say steel or coal factories let it go negative let it not let it be in the red for a while because um you will be capturing plenty uh, to max out and then multiple times to capture more so thank you for um making it this far into the video. I want to thank um, Timothy, Nils, Sir Toyjet, and others that are not popping into my head right now for supporting me on Patreon. But everybody else, like, if you made it this far, give it that like up. Um, and if you have another topic that you want me to cover, World War II, whether it's wargaming, you know, my thoughts on bring into the wargaming or just other things, let me know. I'm not saying I'll do it right away, but I'd like to know what you're like to hear me talk on about. Thanks so much. See you next time for, yes, more Hearts of Iron, more other stuff. Thanks you, everyone.